Hello, my name is Cleida Tani and I'm Doctor of Physical Therapy and today we're going to talk about the cerebellum pathologies and their, their rehabilitation. But before starting with our lectures, I wanted to tell you that you can find the print version of this lecture in the links below. So, uh, what about uh, what is cerebellum and what are the pathologies of cerebellum? So, we know that the cerebellum is part of our uh, central nervous system and it's located in the occipital part of our head. It's symmetric and uh, it has two hemispheres and the main activity of the cerebellum is corrective and inhibitory activity of our body and of our movements. So uh, the cerebellum in a way processes information from uh, parts of our brain, especially from the motor cerebral cortex, the basal nuclei and sensory receptors. So uh, his, uh, the main function of cerebellum is how it's to correct uh, the movement and to inhibit any different uh, pathologies of the movement. Uh, if we take the anatomy of the cerebellum, we have three parts of the hemisphere. We have the paleocerebellum, which are the, uh, the two hemispheres of our body, of, of the cerebellum. And the main activity of the paleocerebellum is maintaining balance while standing and walking. Then we have the archicerebellum, which receives information from the vestibular part of our uh, body and in a way um, uh, gives information about the position of our head and our, in, and our body in the space. And we have neocerebellum, which uh, uh, main, uh, the main activity of the neocerebellum is the coordination of the movement of the limbs, upper limbs and lower limbs. So uh, normally if we have pathologies of the cerebellum is because of different etiologies like traumatic etiologies, ischemic etiologies or uh, uh, hemorrhagy in the cerebellar part. So when we have uh, a traumatic incident of the cerebellum, the main symptoms are uh, the ones uh, below. So the first one is the ataxia, which uh, it's mostly known about the loss of muscle interaction. You can see that uh, the person is unable in a way to perform uh, precise and coordinated movements. So sometimes you can see a person with uh, traumatic cerebellar disorders that they are not stable and maybe they are walking with a, a big base uh, in their legs. So you can see them that they don't have balance. And this is typical of ataxia. Uh, then we have dysmetria, which is uh, a target error. Typical uh, in the pathologies of the cerebellum is hypermetria, and hypermetria is exceeding the target. The way that you can test it with your patient is with the test of finger nose. So the patient closes his eyes and he brings his finger to his nose, and what you will see is the patient with cerebral disorders exceeding the target, going to uh, the eye or to the forehead. Or sometimes you can see the tests are also heel to knee, like you can see in this photo, or heel to foot. And uh, the same way you can see the hypermetry where uh, the patient exceeds the target of uh, intended target. And then we have macrography. Macrography is typical when you see the patient to have a tendency to write big characters. Uh, and the way you can uh, test it is by telling the person to write his name or her name. And you could see that uh, he is trying to exceed or to make big characters and letters. Also, we can see the person have dysarthria, and dysarthria is uh, um, problems with the speech and uh, the tonality of their voice, because we say that the cerebellum has um, uh, inhibitory activity and corrective activity. When we have pathologies of the cerebellum, you could see that the patient uh, cannot, or the cerebellum cannot in a way uh, um, inhibit the tone of the, of the pharynx and the larynx, so the patient uh, cannot talk in the perfect way. And most of the times uh, he has an incomprehensive and highly tonality of the voice. Uh, the most known uh, uh, pathology or the most known symptom of uh, cerebellum pathologies is the intensive tremor that the patient has. So you could see that he has vibration of the extremities, especially when there is movement and in the end of the target. So sometimes when you do the dysmetria uh, test, finger nose, you could see a tremor while going to the nose and hypermetria exceeding the target intended. Also, we have this diadohokinesis, and this diadohokinesis is a typical um, uh, inability to coordinate uh, very 
uh, fast and alternating movements. And a way to test them is if you ask the patient to do alternating quick movements of the hands, and you could see that the patient slows down one hand on both hands and cannot coordinate both hands while he's doing that. Also, we have hypotonus and passivity, different from the other uh, central nervous system pathologies. Uh, in the cerebellum pathologies, we don't have spasticity or rigidity. It's typical that here you have uh, passivity of the patient and the tonus, that uh, you have hypotonus uh, of the muscle. So uh, you, we can test this uh, while um, uh, changing the position of the patient, and we can see that the patient is unable to correct his position. Uh, also, we have a synergy, which means the, lacks, the lack of the exact timing of the muscle interaction for the given mov movement. But the timing of the muscle activity, it's uh, typical, um, it's normal when we don't have any pathologies. So when we do whatever uh, movement we are doing, all the muscles have a, a special time lapse and the timing when they are activated and when they are contracted. When we have a problem with the cerebellum and we have a pathology with the cerebellum, this timing is uh, interrupted. So you could see that the movement is not uh, uh, well directed and it, it's maybe it's even fast or also you have the tremor while the patient is moving. And the last, uh, one of the last uh, symptoms is the nystagmus, which is in the, uh, in the um, eye and you can see vertical or horizontal nystagmus of the eye of the patient. When we are talking about rehabilitation, about a patient with cerebellar uh, disorders, of course, it's a multidisciplinary work. So we're talking about physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and spa treatment biology. Uh, physical therapy is important for every exercise, and we are going to talk about it. And also, but also occupational therapy, it's very important for the activity daily living of the patient, his hygiene, the way he's uh, eating, the way he's living, and uh, all the details that a physical therapist maybe is not uh, able to control. Also, speech and language therapy is very important because the patient, as we said, has dysarthria, so it's uh, very important to do speech therapy, so he will maybe fix his problem. And balneology and spa treatment is mostly for chronic patients and uh, a better longevity and uh, well-being. Uh, when we are starting uh, our rehabilitation program, especially physical therapy program, we have to take something, uh, some uh, things in mind that uh, the patient with cerebellar uh, disorders is very fatigued and uh, he can uh, be rapidly fatigued. So we prefer mostly programs that are short and that are uh, frequent, like, every, like each day maybe short uh, programs of exercises than just one hour of exercising, which would be very difficult for our patient. Also, we prefer uh, mostly individual work with the patient than group exercises, because group exercises are not uh, preferred because the patient is not able to uh, comprehend some exercises or um, incorporate in the group. Uh, the main Purposes of the physiotherapy are a lot, of course, but the main ones are the improvement of intentional and supportive motor skills, like the balance and uh, intentional uh, uh, movement of the patient. Also, with, uh, part of this is locomotor coordination regulation, so it means we can regulate uh, the movement and the locomotor uh, part of the uh, patient. We have to improve the ataxia, the balance, we have to improve the tremor and slow the tremor, especially while moving. And the basis of every movement is the postural balance, which is part of, uh, of the physiotherapy. We will talk about three types of exercises. The first type of exercises in physiotherapy are Frankel exercises for the patient with cerebellar disorders. The purpose of Frankel exercises are a reduction of ataxia, and uh, locomotor in coordination. The way that the Frankel exercises are done, it's uh, like the firstly, we exercise with verbal control, so the patient can see the extremity or his body in front of the mirror. Then we, we make slow uh, movements, and then we uh, make fast movements with verbal control, and in the end, we uh, continue with movements with closed eyes. So this is the typical way we're doing the Frankel exercises for cerebellar disorders. 
So uh, we exercise this at, we exercise at slow speed. So sometimes the same exercise like flexion of the elbow, we exercise at slow speed. The patient has to look at his uh, hand while doing the exercise. Then you, the, after the slow speed, we can go with high speed. So the same exercise, the patient has to do it a little bit in a higher speed. And then the patient closes his eyes and tries to do the same exercise uh, in high speed. Uh, sometimes uh, we alternate both of high speed and slow speed so we can uh, change the, um, uh, the perception of uh, the, of the uh, articulation of the, of the joint and the body. But you have to take in mind that slow exercises are more difficult than uh, high speed ex exercises because the patient has to concentrate more while doing the exercise. And uh, sometimes when the exercise is very difficult, like squats or lunges or uh, other eccentric exercises, we divide the, uh, the exercise in phases and then we combine them all together. So it will be easier for the patient to remember it and then in a way coordinate the whole movement from the beginning till the end. Uh, then we firstly help the patient with manual contact if it's needed normally. Sometimes like if the patient uh, needs to understand where the movement is, then we have to manually explain to the patient how to move uh, his joint or his limb or uh, his body. And then we take out uh, the, the contact and we see if the patient is able to do it by himself or not. Uh, and also we are trying verbally to explain the patient what he will do uh, at, uh, and how to do it. And always start with exercises from the lowest position. So it means like a supine or laying in the bed. And then we move to exercises that are in unstable positions like standing, standing in one leg, standing in um, sitting on the side or sitting in a ball. So it would be more difficult for the patient to, get to, to balance uh, his body. When we, uh, when we say about verbal control, we also say about our commands to the, the person, what we have to, uh, when we talk to the patient, how we have to talk to him. And the comments should be given at once. Uh, and also sometimes it should be numbered and rhythmic so the patient can continue the movement while we are talking. So when you say flex, extend, flex, extend, so he understands that he has to flex his elbow and extend his elbow. This is a way of explaining it. Also, we perform each exercise no more than four, maybe maximum 10 times, but uh, it's, you, we have to be very careful with the patient because he's um, a very fatigued. So most of the times, if we exceed the number of uh, repetition, it would be very difficult for the patient to continue the program. So maybe it's better to, uh, to make uh, um, less repetition for his exercises and keep a, a short program and then repeat that program the same day in the afternoon or another day. Uh, maximum of the program, it should be 30 minutes and also it can be repeated twice a day. It is better than uh, having like one hour uh, program with a patient like that. Uh, very important is for the patient to the, for the room to be well lit. So the patient is able to see his limbs and his body. Maybe also um, exercises in front of a mirror would be a good idea for a patient with cerebellar disorders. And uh, the patient should be positioned in a way that he can see his body, as we say that. Okay, this is, uh, the, these were the Frankel exercises, the basic exercises for a cerebellar disorder. But sometimes we also can use the diagnostic exercise or, or the diagnostic tests can be used like exercises. As we said, figure to nose, heel to toe, heel to knee. These are diagnostic exercises for hypermetria and they can be used again uh, a way, in a way as exercises to, uh, uh, to incorporate uh, coordination and to slow the tremor that the patient has. So uh, like the idea of uh, bringing your finger to the nose, uh, the patient can try to do it slowly or sometimes we can try to um, handle the patient's hand while doing the exercise. He has to see what he's doing. Then we are trying to uh, 
a higher speed of the movement. So he's doing the same exercise in a higher speed. And then in the end, when we see that the patient is able to do the exercises in a higher speed, then we close the patient's eye. So he closes his eye and he tries to do the same exercise with closed eyes. So the diagnostic tests sometimes are very nice uh, to use as uh, a treatment for the patient. And the last one uh, are the balance exercises, which are very important for the cerebellar disorders. Because as we said, one of the biggest symptoms and problems of cerebellar disorders are, is ataxia and balance uh, uh, control. So uh, we can do some exercises, slow exercises like weight on, weight on one uh, foot and the other foot or stand in one foot. And we practice uh, the patient's reactions in changes of the, of the position of the patient. Maybe we can uh, train the patient how to sit, stand, change his position and quickly change his position. Also, we can uh, try gait modifications like uh, walking in a small base or walking in a bigger base of, of the limbs or uh, walking your toes or walking uh, on your heels and um, climbing the stairs uh, or whatever you, if you think is better or it's difficult for the patient to maintain and you, need, you see that the patient has to change and has to improve in his gait. So gait modifications are very good to, to improve the balance control of the patient. Also, we can use balls and unstable surfaces as we can see in the photo. So we can make the, every exercise even more difficult. And these are the uh, three types of exercise that you can do as a physical therapist. So uh, in this way, we can uh, close our lecture and we will see, uh, we'll see you in the next lecture. Thank you very much for your attention.